Okay, ten minutes past three. A consultant psychiatrist specialising in treating ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, has told this programme that an estimated 2% of UK adults may have the condition but don't know it. And a leading charity dealing with the disorder says there is virtually no practical help available across the UK for adults who have managed to get a diagnosis. There are plenty of support services and charities helping children. Adults are mostly left to their own devices. For the next hour, we're going to be joined by the satirist Rory Bremen who was diagnosed as an adult, Kuban Naidu, the consultant psychiatrist who diagnosed him, Tony Lloyd, the chief executive of the charity, and the a which is the ADHD Foundation. And also we'll be speaking to Andrew Williams from a, a body in Liverpool a little bit later on in the hour as well. But uh, Roy Bremner, we'll come to you first of all. Thanks so much for joining us on, on Hi, Afternoon Dan. Edition. Um, what made you start to consider... The, the idea that you possibly did have ADHD? Um, well, it's a close relative uh, of mine who was diagnosed with the condition about um, three or four years ago, and I saw what they went through and what the family went through. And But so many of their symptoms uh, rang a bell with me, and I, I look back over my own childhood and, and adolescence, really, and well, <laughs> I'm, I'm still adolescent in many ways, <laughs> um, and so much of, the, of you know, the impetuosity, the forgetfulness, the fact I'm easily distracted and disorganised, uh, always taking on too much. In fact, even for this interview, I had about three or four pages of notes and I've left them at home so <laughs> that's very very typical um, but the more I, I think back um, to to what, what life was like going through school going through college going through university and, and it hasn't really changed um, in some ways you know it's, it's it's my greatest friend and my worst enemy because uh, from a comedian's point of view if you have a mind that is sort of bouncing around a bit like a pinball mm. machine it's it's kind of quite a useful thing but if you're trying to be organized and I think in particular if you're a, a child um, it's 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 incredibly difficult and, and that's the area which I know we're talking about adults today but um, uh, you said 2% but for children it's like 1 in 20 which is about 500,000 children which means you know half a million families mm. are really struggling with, with something which is incredibly difficult it's like having an unexploded bomb in the house which will go off at some stage during the day and I, and I can't begin to tell you from, from that experience mm. um, the frustration, the despair the torment that you go through and these are children who are often excluded at school um, and the statistics are heartbreaking we'll come back to them later on has understanding the condition that you had you had finding that out as an adult does that help to explain the, the sort of child that you were can you under understand why you acted in the way that you did in some circumstances oh absolutely i mean i just give you a couple of examples i mean as a child i remember oh, we were we used to play sort of a uh, lot of rugby at school and we did i think we played football one day on, on a sort of very icy pitch because the, the pitches were frozen and i remember robbing our own center forward who was just about to shoot at goal and i just had this complete rush of blood to the head so i tackled our own center forward and, the, and then shot about 20 yards wide of the goal and it was just one of those remember when Barthez uh, let a goal in for Manchester United he just pulled his jersey over his head and was just in a sort of a kind of spasm of, of embarrassment and frustration and despair and it was just completely stupid um, and that's the kind of thing it's just a totally sort of irrational rush, rush of blood to the head but as an adult I can remember I was having a, a riding lesson a few years ago and they say well listen you've got to have a line running through from your, from your shoulder through your elbow through a hip down to your heel and so I started thinking well what oh that sort of like a sort of line running through things it'd be like a, a bit like a kebab really if I was having a kebab now what have I maybe have a sort of mushroom maybe a piece of meat uh, a bit of uh, pepper maybe a bit of and by the time you know that I'd finish out how to thread the kebab the teacher was just screaming at me saying what are you doing what are you doing and, and I was just away cooking a kebab but that's that's a, a, an absolutely classic sort of syndrome you just you're just easily distracted if i give you two examples it's a bit like uh you know if you're in a, a shop when they're, they're if they sell televisions you know in john lewis or something like that and other sh other stores are available yes, sorry thank you for that rory <laughs> um <laughs> and they're about sort of 12 or 15 televisions and they're all showing something different it, uh, it's a little bit like that or listening to a radio station uh, a radio with about five or six different stations at once and you're flipping uh, between them but uh, there is also the ability to hyper-focus. I mean, it, it, there are some benefits, if you like. Um, when you say to... hyper-focus, what do you mean exactly? I mean, if focus intently, constant, concentrate intensely. Um, if you imagine all those television screens that I was talking about, um, and somebody once said if they all flip onto the same channel, um, 
Mm-hmm. That that sometimes happens. So um, it is, as I say, it's my, my greatest friend and my worst enemy. Um, and I did a little program about this about three or four years ago on the BBC. It's called ADHD and Me. If anyone is sort of uh, has a child or is going through this um, and just has a little bit longer to listen to it, it's still there. It's called ADHD and Me. Um, and so if you if you put, put ADHD and Me and, and Rory Bremner in there, you'll find it. And it's it's um, I talk to people, a lot of them in Liverpool actually, about what they went through and their stories are fascinating and it might help people because I think the most important thing is to raise the awareness and and do away with some of the stigma because people say oh it's just it's naughty children and there are some of those of course there are but um, in many cases they're not and it's 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 hell Uh, and I'll come to a letter I've got in front of me later on. You talk about an unexploded bomb and in a house with somebody who's undiagnosed the despair and the torment were you yourself despairing at some points during your young life Um, or during your adult life even with it? Oh yeah, well it's it, it's frustrating when you sort of when you forget things and you you get things wrong, um, and you know if your if your, cla- well, if your classmates laugh at you, that's an advantage if you're a comedian. But um, I was very scatty as a child, uh, and you know you just say to yourself, oh, "Not again, not again. Why have I done that again?" Um, and if you imagine as a child, you know we 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 teach children or try to get them to sit still and to concentrate and to not be distracted and to be organised. And for an ordinary child, that's difficult. For an ADHD child, that's that's virtually impossible and so you know they'll get into trouble and they might be seen as being disruptive and so they might get sent out of class and each time that happens that takes another little layer of, of self-esteem of of self-belief um, uh, and it wears that child down and, and the anxiety and, and the despair uh, it, it actually later on it, it starts to wear them down in terms of their, their brain development both functionally um, and, uh, and another word which I've forgotten but um, <laughs> I know there you go but uh, and in fact you know 18% of, of young people who are diagnosed with ADHD will uh, will attempt suicide at some stage. It's it's a desperately difficult um, uh, thing to live with um, as a family. Um, it has its hilarious moments, as I say, um, but it's you know it, it is it, it does have its hugely frustrating um, moments. And, and but but things can be done to help. Let's bring if you... I could just say, just yeah, of course, I, I mentioned yeah. a note because I, I lost my my notes as I say coming here, but um, I did bring a file with me, and just what fell literally fell out of it is uh, a little thing here. It says, "This is what I got at the theatre," um, and it just says, "This is just a note to thank you for your documentary on ADHD. After six years of hell and complete confusion, I finally know what's wrong with me." And your documentary came four months after my diagnosis and let my parents realise that so many things I've done weren't my fault. I finally feel like I've got a future. Thank you. I wanted to bring, um, uh, sorry, that's, impo- that's important. Yeah, yeah no, go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Oh, we've got uh, Kuba Naido here. Who, uh, am I right in thinking you diagnosed Rory's ADHD? <laughs> well, that's that's not entirely correct. Um, I met with Rory and we spoke about ADHD okay. and went through the. Was he a classic case in your eyes? <laughs> I think he certainly does. Well, forgive me, Rory. Uh, he does certainly have a lot of the I've got my criteria <laughs> that would tick the boxes mm. for some of the core symptoms of ADHD. How difficult is it, Cuban, to diagnose somebody, an adult, with ADHD? I think the challenge, Sarah, comes in looking at someone who's presenting much later in life. Now, the vast majority of individuals who get a diagnosis of ADHD will have the diagnosis made before the age of 12. So a school-going child, it's much easier. You've got parents there who can provide information. You've got school reports. You've got people who are monitoring them in a variety of settings who can give you a very good idea of how these individuals are presenting on a day-to-day basis. For the adult who's presenting at the age of 30 or 40... And has developed all these coping developed, mechanisms. Absolutely. And also, where do you get the school reports? Where do you get the parent who's going to give you a collateral history? So you're relying a lot on the actual symptoms that they are then going to be presenting to you. But the core feature in terms of adults, in terms of making the diagnosis, the core is the clinical interview. Can I ask you, and uh, bear in mind this is a bit weird because obviously Rory is listening, but when he knew that he had ADHD... <laughs> There's nothing like being talked about while you're yeah. there, did, is there? Did he respond <laughs> in a... Should I leave the room? <laughs> no, I, I, you can come back on this in a minute as well, Rory. Did he respond in a classic way? There was, he... there, there was a silence, surprisingly, with Rory. Rory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a silence. Can we edit uh, the surprising was... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think Rory will agree that he was quiet for a bit because I think he just realised that this, the impact of it and what it really meant in terms of what he had been through. And I think we see that quite often with adults who come to you suspecting they may have the condition and then going through the symptoms. You go through the symptoms with them at the end of it. And remember, 
ADHD is one of those conditions, and Rory mentioned about suicidality as one of the problems related to ADHD, but ADHD is a highly comorbid condition. Up to 80% of individuals with adult ADHD will have another psychiatric disorder, be it depression, anxiety, bipolar affective so disorder. It so it is a chemical imbalance? It's, it is a chemical imbalance. It's a, it's a neuropsychiatric disorder. So you have structural and functional abnormalities of the brain areas of the brain that are involved with executive functioning. So, you know, planning, organization, mm. prioritizing information and dealing with lots of information. Leaving your notes at home or what? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, yeah. exactly. and, and setting off late and all that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Is there any evidence, Kubin, that it, there are, it's more men than women or is it right down the both? Well, interestingly, in children, you see the condition more in boys, boys. than you do with That's girls. What I thought. Now you'd ask yourself, why is that the case? Well, if we look at inattention, hyperactivity and impulsivity, yeah. boys may have more of the impulsive and hyperactive symptoms. So from a behavioral point of view, they are, target, they are picked up very early in school. So there may be girls with the condition. And, you know, I've seen patients who have the, have the inattentive symptoms and they don't get identified until much later in life because they be, they behave, their behavior is not an issue. So they're not picked up mm. at that uh, school going yes. age. But when you actually go into the adult um, age group, it actually there's an approximation of adults and uh, ma males and females in the adult population. But it is underdiagnosed, presumably, as well at this point, indeed. Or we're going to bring in Tony, who's the chief executive of the charity now. Did you want to ask something? Sorry, no, I, was, I know Roy was going to jump back in on, on uh, uh, what Kuben was telling us, but I was going to actually ask, yeah. ask Tony a question because there'd be lots of people, I would imagine, Tony listening to this and thinking, mm -hmm. well, that sounds a little bit like me. I, I do some of the sure. things that Roy was describing or some of the things that, that Kuben was talking about. Yeah, but I think what you have to remember is, I mean, all of us at, at some time or other can be impulsive or hyperactive. These are quite common human behaviours. What constitutes um, ADHD is where somebody presents with those behaviours above a certain threshold and consistently. So this is how you challenge the people that say, including doctors, that say ADHD doesn't exist? Um, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I've heard... Um, a number of professionals saying to me, well, you know, we think it's overdiagnosed, but actually there's absolutely no evidence that, there, mm -hmm. that it is overdiagnosed in this country. And on the contrary, it would appear that while the National Institute of Clinical Excellence say it affects about one in 20 of the childhood population, mm -hmm. in fact, the number of children actually diagnosed is more around 2% rather than the 5% estimate that NICE are advocating. So there are lots of children out there who don't have a diagnosis, who aren't being supported. And if you can imagine for them what it's like starting school at five, you know, um, where they're being asked to do all kinds of things like sit still, concentrate, work independently, don't fidget, things that they find biologically really much more difficult to do than their peers, and then they find themselves daily being disciplined or told off. You can then see how children will lose that genetic love of learning where the whole experience of classroom based learning becomes a source of stress for them. And, yeah. and then high levels of stress hormones in such a pervasive way will start to affect how the child's brain develops, which will just exacerbate their ADHD in the longer term. Well, if there are teachers, children, parents and adults listening today that this is all sounding very familiar to you, please do get in touch. 85058 is the text number. Yeah, we've got a couple of texts on this already. I'm 43, an anonymous text this one. I believe I have ADHD. I'm very successful, physics degree. I have my own business. I'm a self-made millionaire. I've done lots of stuff in my life, but I've showed classic symptoms as a kid. I get very, very intense intensely bored i self-medicate badly with drink and i've got into all sorts of trouble any advice other than antidepressants appreciated um <laughs> well yeah Cuban, do you Cuban. want to start with that <laughs> i think with someone presenting like that and i think this is often the problem that individuals assume just because you may have a university degree or you're in higher education or you're actually a very successful businessman um like the person who just sent the text you can't have ADHD. You can, you can. But again, like Tony said, it's the degree of impairment and where that is actually impairing you on a day to day basis. So you may be very successful at what you do and that impulsivity of that individual and the drive that they may have, have may have been very functional in him making his million. I don't know how many, how many million did he say? He just said a millionaire. Yeah. It could, okay. be, could be one, you know. could be loads. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, so, so it but is. Also, 
it, it, is, it is an important thing to identify, well, yes, that might have been functional, but he is now struggling in other areas potentially. Mm -hmm. And presumably it may be the interpersonal domain that he's struggling with. He's mentioned about self-medicating with alcohol as well. So my advice is see your clinician, see your GP, get some advice and let's explore whether it is ADHD. It may very well be something else, but let's, you know, have an open mind and uh, get some help. There is that element of, of sort of slightly chaotic lifestyle. I sometimes think about, you know, spinning plates, you know, if you see that sort of circus mm -hmm. trick and you're sort of spinning plates and then you're just paying attention, then then there's one at the other end, which is falling off and smashing. Um, you know, you're sort of living your life in, in, in some ways sort of state of permanent crisis. And there are ways as an adult, you used to start to develop more coping strategies. And I'd say so amongst those are, you know, um, constantly making lists, uh, preparing the day before, um, trying to just, just make sure that you're, you are organizing before you actually get to something. Do you have um, so to I'm take sort of, medication, Rory, if you don't mind me asking? No, I don't. Actually, you know, it's a weird kind of thing because because what I what I want really want to do is to make a documentary about this. And at, that, at the point that I make a documentary, is that that's when I will um, uh, try the medication and and because I don't want to fake it. If you, if sure. you know what I mean, I don't want I don't want to sort of. It's a bit like when you do. Who do you think you are? Um, and they show you these things. They don't want you to know anything before you're on camera. And I want to sort of go through this mm. uh, and see what the results are are in, in real time, um, as it were. But I mean, so many of the people, uh, the, the childhood thing is very, very important if it's caught early enough and it's diagnosed early enough because they're often the brightest and the most creative. I mean, the sort of poster boys for ADHD in adulthood, people like Will I Am and Jamie Oliver, Will Smith, Justin Timberlake, who said he had ADHD and OCD together. He said, imagine what that's like. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the guy with agoraphobia and claustrophobia who blinked themselves to death. Right. <laughs> 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 on, on the health... On the health issue. That's a good ADHD joke, though. On, on, yeah. the, on the health issue, let's bring in uh, Andrew Williams, who's the chairman of a, a wonderfully named institution, Liverpool Adult ADHD Ladders of Life Limited. Andrew, hey. we're getting, we're getting yeah. loads of texts and tweets. I know Rory's yeah. done some work with you in the past. We're getting loads of texts and tweets. Uh, on that, well, you, you, you're talking about helping in Liverpool. Is that through? Did you know Andrew before? Well, the, Liverpool's a big place. Okay, all right. Well, you know, I, I, I used to live in Liverpool. I'm aware of how big it is. But anyway, um, I have suspected my son has had this for a while. Now struggling at university lectures. Any help? We can get loads of questions like that, Andrew. People who, who don't know whether they've got it or pe pe members of their family have got it, and just struggling to know how to get it diagnosed and then what to do once it is diagnosed. Yeah, I mean, to to be fair, Dan, I think uh, I think the diagnosis is often just a start. I think, uh, you know, okay, here's your diagnosis, here's your, here's your letter from your consultant psychiatrist mm -hmm. telling you you've got ADHD. Well, where'd you go from there? And I think what Ladders of Life has, has done is that we've, you know, we, we've created a service. We've created services which are, you know, we're relative, uh, you know, and relevant to people who, who need support. You know, we, do, we basically do four things. We, you know, we do individual and group sessions where we'll explore the understanding and help people understand the symptoms. We'll then help people to manage and cope managing and coping strategies, you know, and we'll also, we'll also help people interact with public services. You know, if your life's in chaos and a meltdown, then it's pretty hard to, to, to move on and, and, and bring some order. So we help people rationalize, you know, provide support services, which are, you know, uh, sympathetic, mm. but more empathetic. You know, it's our, our organization is run by people with ADHD for people with ADHD. So, you know, that's, that's a sort of unique selling point for us. Were you diagnosed late on in life? Yes. Yes. What, what age were you? Uh, I was 36. And How did it happen? Sorry. How did it happen that you were diagnosed? I, I just, uh, you know, I'd, I'd always been a, a, a serial procrastinator. I was always, <laughs> I was always a person who, who, who wouldn't actually ever do anything until it was right to the last minute and the pressure. And I, I actually thought that the, the sort of uh, the rush of the adrenaline and feeling yeah. under pressure always brought out the best of me. And for most, most cases it did. But then you recognise that, you know, that's not, not a really good way to sort of live your life and, and organise yourself. I mean, you know, one of the things I'm glad Cuba mentioned uh, National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence guidelines because our services aim to to replicate what though what that advice is. You know, it's 678 pages, and I think that you know the, the part of the problem I think is that there's a there's, there's a heavy emphasis on clinical intervention. Mm. Yeah, the countervailing complementary complementary approach, which nice guidelines we need in terms of aftercare and support for education and one and employment and tackling wider issues of social isolation and managing and coping strategies for healthy and productive lives. That's the key. The diagnosis should open the key to the door to those services. Now, Ladders of Life do three or four things based upon that. But one of the most successful things we do is that, you know, people want to progress in life. You know, we, we've developed a bespoke course called ADHD Works, 
which helps people, long-term ADHD sufferers, to gain education, skills, and enter employment in a supported and empathetic way. Now, you know, we've got fantastic partnership with the DWP, who recognise that it's got huge investor save potential. Liverpool CCG are very, very interested and, you know, huge supporters of the work we do. Um, the, the pattern is changing. Slowly, it, 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 you know, it's coming. So, you know, I agree, we must raise awareness. Mm. But we must have services to refer to. Raising awareness is, is great, but public perception needs to be tackled by positive stories about ADHD and how things actually react Andrew, to, to what happens. Andrew, Tony, Cuban and Roy are all going to stay with us until four o'clock. We might have to take a little bit of a break after the news yes, and sport because the Prime Minister is due to make a statement on the EU budget, so we might have to interrupt our discussion on ADHD. Do you want to do it now, I'm, I'm very cross. <laughs> Can you can David Cameron hand to the news with Rachel Bland? Rory, can you do it? Can David Cameron well, do that for us? Well, now we're going to hear what's going on in your part of the country um, with um, with with is, is it Rachel? I think it is, or is it might be Theresa May? I don't know. <laughs> on digital, online, smartphone, and tablet. This is BBC Five Live. The last UK troops have left Helmand Province in Afghanistan, as a poll suggests, sixty-eight percent of the UK public thought the campaign hadn't been worthwhile. The BBC poll also found 42% thought the UK was less safe as a result of the 13-year campaign. Questions have been raised about the security surrounding David Cameron after an incident in which a man appeared to run into him in Leeds. The man apparently collided with the Prime Minister as he left the city's civic hall. OK, thank you, Rachel, because David Cameron is making a statement now in the Commons. I know the thoughts of the whole House will be with the friends and families of every one of the 453 British soldiers who lost their lives in this long campaign. We will never forget their sacrifice for us. When Al-Qaeda attacked the Twin Towers in 2001, they planned that attack from Afghanistan, operating freely under the Taliban regime. Our incredible servicemen and women have driven Al-Qaeda out, and they have built up and trained the Afghan forces none of which even existed in 2001, so that the Afghans can take control of their own security. I said when I became Prime Minister that I would bring our combat troops home. Today they are coming home and we should be incredibly proud of all they've done to keep our country safe. Yeah, 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 yeah. With permission, Mr Speaker, I'd like to make a statement on last week's European Council. Before turning to the issue of our contributions to the EU, let me first update the House on three significant agreements where the UK played an important role. On Ebola, on climate change and on the situation in Ukraine. First on Ebola, the world is facing one of the, world's, one of the worst public health emergencies in a generation. Playing our part in halting the rise of this terrible disease is not just about meeting our moral obligations, it is also the single most effective way of preventing Ebola infecting people here in the United Kingdom. That is why Britain has been making such a major contribution to the international response, pledging over £205 million and sending troops and health workers to West Africa. But it also means that Britain must use its influence to get other countries to step up their contributions too. Before the Council, I wrote to all my fellow leaders urging that we significantly step up our collective response. And at the meeting, Member States agreed to my proposal to more than double the EU effort by pledging over a billion euros in assistance. The Council also agreed to increase the deployment of medical and support staff in the region and for Member States to guarantee proper care for our courageous health workers. Second, it is vital that Europe plays its part if we're to secure a global deal on climate change in Paris next year. One of the problems we've faced in the past is that instead of just setting a binding target on carbon emissions, the EU has set binding national targets on things like renewables and energy efficiency. These diktats over how each country should reach its commitments can pile up costs on our industries, consumers and families who don't want to pay any more on their energy bills than they have to. And they create an unnecessary trade-off between cutting carbon emissions and promoting economic growth. At this Council, we have chosen a different path. We have reached a landmark commitment to deliver at least 40% reductions in greenhouse gases by 2030, but we have rejected any new binding national targets for renewables or energy efficiency, giving us full flexibility over how we reduce our carbon, allowing us to do so at the lowest possible cost for businesses and consumers. Mr Speaker, this is another example of where British leadership has helped the EU to step up and meet its international obligations, while at the same time protecting our national interest by keeping energy bills down for businesses and Britain's hard-working families. Yeah. 
The Council also discussed the situation in Ukraine and relations with Russia. We welcome the Minsk agreement between Kiev, Moscow and the separatists, but the Council was also clear that much more must be done to implement that agreement before the EU should consider lifting any of the sanctions put in place in response to the conflict and in response to Russia's actions. The Council welcomed the parliamentary elections that took place in the Ukraine yesterday, and it made clear it would not recognise the outcome of any elections organised by the separatists outside the framework of Ukrainian law. Mr Speaker, let me turn to the issue over the UK's contribution to the Euro contributions to the European Union. I want to be clear with the House how the demand for the UK to repay money has come about, and while the, why the scale and timing of this demand is unacceptable. Mr Speaker, in an organisation like the EU, if your economy grows a little faster or a little slower, then there can be adjustments every year to the amount that you pay. In some years, the UK adjustment has been negative, as it was in 2008, 2009, 2011 and 2012, and in some years we contribute a little bit more. This happens every year. And when the UK is growing at 3% a year, and many European economies are growing much more slowly, it would not be surprising to find Britain being asked to pay a little bit more this year. But what has never happened is for €2 billion Euros to be demanded. This represents around 20% of our net contribution to the EU last year. Member States collectively are being asked to pay almost four times the highest gross figure requested in recent years. And it is simply not acceptable for the EU to make these kinds of demands and to do so through a fast-track process lasting barely a month. Two billion euros is bigger than many countries' entire gross contributions. It cannot just be nodded through by the EU bureaucracy as some kind of technical adjustment. It is British taxpayers' money, and it is not small change, but it is a vast sum. So this has to be examined in detail and discussed properly. That is why I interrupted the Council meeting on Friday to seek an urgent resolution to this issue. I was supported by the Prime Ministers of Italy, Holland, Malta, Greece and others, and the Council agreed there would be an urgent discussion with Finance Ministers to resolve the issue going forwards. Mr Speaker, it's not just about the scale of the money being demanded, it is also the timetable. The Commission admits it does not actually need this. Indeed, the President of the Commission wasn't even aware of it on Thursday evening. So there is no pressing need for the money to be paid. There are fundamental questions over the fairness of these payments. For example, the proposal is for funds to be taken from the UK to correct historic contributions to the EU budget dating back to 2002 and to be redistributed based on the current share of gross national income to countries which only joined the EU in 2004 and 2007. But it's not just that Britain would lose out, it is also perverse that a country like Greece, at the heart of the crisis in the Eurozone, is being asked to find money to pay back to countries like Germany. And the revised gross national income statistics on which these adjustments are based are also not yet finalised. The numbers are a provisional estimate, and the EU-wide process to quality assure the figures will not conclude until well into 2015. So, Mr Speaker, Britain will not be paying €2 billion Euros to anyone on the 1st of December. And we reject this scale of payment. We will be challenging this in every way possible. We want to check on the way the statistics were arrived at, the methodology that was used. We will crawl through this in exhaustive detail. Mr Speaker, the events at last week's Council will not, to use some British understatement, have enhanced the reputation of the European Union in the United Kingdom. As the Italian Prime Minister put it, even the EU's founding fathers would turn to Euroscepticism when faced with some of the things that you've seen here. The European Union has to change. It has to regain trust. And that starts by understanding and respecting the fact that these payments and adjustments are about the hard-earned taxes of its citizens. This is just one of the many challenges in our long campaign to reform the European Union, but it is vital we stick to the task. We have already cut the EU budget, got Britain out of the bailout schemes, vetoed a treaty that wasn't in our national interest, made vital progress on cutting red tape and completing the single market, and we're leading the push for what will be the biggest bilateral trade deal in history between the EU and the US. None of this is easy, 
Progress is hard won. It requires perseverance and hard work. We will carry on defending our national interests and fighting with all we have to reform the EU over the coming years. And, Mr Speaker, at the end of 2017, it will not be the Brussels bureaucracy or the politicians of any party who will decide whether we remain in the EU or not. If I'm Prime Minister, it will be the British people who make that decision through an in-out referendum. And that was David Cameron on his feet there. We will bring you some reaction to that from Labour, which no doubt there will be later on in the day here on Five Live. Let's get uh, a little bit of an update on the sport now with Chris. The Football Association have confirmed that England women's match against Germany at Wembley next month will be in front of a record crowd. 33,000 tickets have already been sold. That's a record for the women's game. Last month, just 40,000 watched Roy Hodgson's men's team beat Norway in a friendly. Striker Natasha Dowie says beating the boys is now a realistic target. Ali McCoy says his job as Rangers manager is safe despite upheaval in the boardroom. Two directors have left the club after the Newcastle owner Mike Ashley loaned them £2 million. The former Newcastle managing director Derek Lambias is set to join the board. Aston Villa boss Paul Lambert says Joe Cole could return from injury tonight against Queen's Park Rangers in the Premier League. We've got full commentary in five live sport, but from seven o'clock, just before the football, you will hear the draw for the first round proper of the FA Cup. And the former president of the FIA, Max Mosley, has warned that more Formula One teams could suffer the financial plights of Marussia and Caterham. Both have entered administration in the last week. Mosley has told Five Live he thinks the sport is skewed in favour of the big teams. You'll hear more from Max Mosley in Five Live Sport from seven. Five Live Breakfast. After 13 years, British troops have formally ended their military operation in Afghanistan. The Defence Secretary, Michael Fallon. In the end, we have left Afghanistan a safer place, a better place. And now it's in the hands of a democratically elected government, a home army who are doing the hard fighting now. There are still Taliban there in North Helmand province. Uh, its people have access to health care and to schooling. Some 7 million of them now at school, half of those uh, girls. That never happened before five live breakfast weekday mornings from six 42 minutes past three and uh, we managed to squeeze in the prime minister as well and a bit of a little bit of a curtailed news and sport for you as well uh, we're going to talk about adhd up until four o'clock when we leave you and drive enters the studio to take you through until seven o'clock tonight uh, let me just reintroduce all the guests we have with us roy bremner um who started the hour who is late diagnosed um with adhd in adult life we've also got chairman andrew williams from the liverpool adult adhd ladders of life limited correct do you like that dan i like yeah, yeah. I wish you did. We, we started using lol long. we started using lol for short before it ever going any currency on the internet so okay. we're a bit gutted over that we should have copyrighted that whenever we yeah, should have could have made some money out of that Andy. cameron thinks it still stands for that right. yeah. <laughs> tony lloyd is here who's the chief executive of the adhd foundation and kuba am i right naidu or naidu Naidu. Naidu, okay. Kuba Naidu, who's a consultant psychiatrist who compiled the figures that we've been looking at today. I want to talk about medication because this is where a lot of the controversy is, isn't it? Um, Kuba, right. if I start with you, um, I've read one American doctor writing about this saying we are raising a generation of people, that, young people particularly, that rely into adult, adulthood on stimulants like Ritalin to calm them down from their ADHD. What's the situation with medication and how prevalent is it as a cure, if you like, or a treatment? ADHD is one of the easiest conditions to treat in terms of its, of its response to medication. And the choices of medication are the stimulants, which you've mentioned, mm -hmm. Ritalin is one such stimulant, methylphenidate, if you'd like, and the non-stimulant medications. Now, in the adults, the stimulants do not have a license as yet in the UK. It's interesting. Right. So if you're going to get the medication, it's off license, but it has to be supervised by a specialist. And the guidance, the nice guidance that Tony mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. actually do advocate the use of methylphenidate as a first line medication. So in terms of the skepticism around medication, there is this fear that maybe ADHD is a condition that, that is driven by the pharma industry, that it's just something that's been created as a profit making scheme. And I think that is a skepticism that is both here in the UK and in the States. Mm -hmm. But as clinicians, we see these individuals, we see them with the level of impairment they have, and we actually also do see the response to the medication. And that is quite dramatic. The response is usually within the first two days of taking the medication. 
Andrew, I want to put the same question to you because it, this article that, that I was reading it was a New York Times thing and it was saying from the 2008 to 2012 the number of adults taking medication for ADHD increased by 53% in the United States. It's, it's nearly doubled, basically. Um, are you concerned by that? Oh, sorry, uh, uh, Tony, I have meant to ask Tony first. Right. Tony and then Andrew. My apologies. Tony, go ahead. In Make an appointment. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I'm, I'm only concerned, really, that anybody with ADHD gets the right support at the right time. And there are a great many people who live quite successfully without relying on medication. I guess I'm worried about what Cuban was saying about the you know, big pharma cashing in on this. Does that um, concern you? No, I'm more concerned, really, that anybody with ADHD gets the right support that mm -hmm. they need. And I don't think that always means medication. There are lots of uh, other kind of interventions which can be offered, particularly self-management skills training, which is particularly important for children and adults, um, but also things like cognitive behavioural therapy, um, mindfulness-based stress relief, things like that. All of those things help contribute towards self-management. And for some people, medication mm -hmm. forms a necessary part of, of that for them. I think you judge every case individually. Um, but nothing to be afraid of, essentially. I, I certainly don't think yeah. so, no, okay. not at all. Can yeah. I pop in there? Just yeah, to Rory, say, yeah. Course. To say, uh, yes, uh, we are talking, in, and uh, you mentioned earlier from, from Andrew, that it, it's not just, it's not really about curing, it's about managing the mm -hmm. condition. And you have to think about the alternatives, um, uh, and Tony's very, very good on that, and the ADHD Foundation in Liverpool is very, very good at um, a sort of uh, a, a multimodal approach. Um, but I think, Kuban, I'm right in saying, when, when we spoke, you said, um, you know, that the effect is, is, is very rapid. It's not like antidepressants where it takes weeks to come on, weeks to come off. And I think Absolutely. It's uh, Kuban, very dramatic. Kuban said to me, it, and it really struck me, he said that with adults, uh, I said, well, how do, how do they describe the, the, the difference? And, mm -hmm. and Kuban said, it's like putting on a pair of spectacles. Huh. It's that different. Yeah. It, that is the difference between, you know, uh, and, and that really struck me at the time as mm. being an, an extraordinary, an extraordinary thing. I mean, I, for me personally, like I think the uh, the so-called uh, medical debate, it's all a bit overblown, really. I think it's a bit of a sideshow. Uh, there are lots of people who access our service who aren't on medica medication. I have no intention of being on medication, but there's the, relative to the levels of impairment. I think that the more important issue is how public services and communities and, and individuals and groups like our own and can actually respond and provide treatments and services. ADHD is a lifespan condition, and I think that we need to... Yeah gear ourselves up to providing genuine services. Uh, you know, the, the investor save profile for all these services is huge. I mean, you know, our ADHD works uh, uh, program, it's got an 80% success rate for people who've got ADHD along term adults. Mm. You know, well, actually, uh, that, that, it, that is it, massive. It, it, it's financially right because the long-term costs for untreated ADHD, they reckon it's about something like sixty-five thousand pounds per child. Is it? That's totally correct. Like That's that. correct. Yeah. 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 yeah, they're huge. Um, they're huge. Sorry, they're just you know any adults with ADHD and most people with ADHD are, you know, they're huge sort of uh, resource users across all service areas. So you know we need to find a way of providing treatment, which, you know. Basically, basic maths tells us that as you know, come, things will, things will improve. Yeah. There's other yeah. related mental issues as well, aren't yeah. there? Yeah. Absolutely. Are we getting so many? Well, Ninety-five percent of people in ninety-five percent of young offenders in, in in prison have have a mental disorder of uh, uh, of some description. Ninety-five percent. So if we got to the root of this, I mean, imagine mm. how many creative people could be helped to not 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 have to go to prison, not have to be excluded from classes. Mm. It's, it would be really transformative. There's loads of text coming in from listeners which I'd like to be able to put to everybody before we go. Um, but also, uh, we've got a bit of a case study and they joined us in the studio as well, which is fantastic. So what's it like realising as an adult that you have ADHD? Let's speak to Sharon Williams. She began to think that she had the condition when her daughter, Chloe, who's also here, was diagnosed. So Thank welcome you both to both coming. of you. Thanks for coming in. Um, by the way, they're not related to Andrew Williams, just for confirmation, OK? You're all Williams is, but there's no family members in here. Just in case you weren't confused <laughs> in <enough already>. the <laughs> probably are. We're, we're all mongrels, Dan. We're all mongrels. We're, we've, we've never had such a packed studio. So um, let's start with you, Sharon, mum, if that's okay, first of all. Uh, w at what age was Chloe first diagnosed? And tell us a little bit about your story. Okay, Chloe was six, um, just before she was seven, she was diagnosed. Um, just on Chloe, sorry, I knew there was something when she was two. And what was it? Um... <clears throat> 
Well, it was ADHD, but we didn't I didn't know at the time. What sort of things did you see in her when she was two? Um, she was hyperactive. She was constantly needing stimulation. That was all I really noticed, is that she con she, she was always on the go. Um, I, she, I couldn't occupy her often enough. Um, and she was quite intelligent as well, so we knew it wasn't, it wasn't in ca a case of she was, you know, she was, she was bad or anything. Um, so at four, I asked for an assessment. Um, she she wasn't diagnosed, but she was assessed at four for ADHD, which I wasn't aware of. Um, and when she was six, she was reassessed and diagnosed just before her seventh birthday. And this all led you to the position where you realised that you were displaying some of the same symptoms. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. As so a how research. did that work then? Mm -hmm. Well, as I'm reading about it, because obviously as a mum, I did look into it, but also I was fortunate enough to be at university at the same time. So I had access to a lot of research. And so I was looking at, you know, quite a lot of academic papers on what ADHD was. And fortunately, I was able to understand it a lot better than a parent probably would. Mm. So as I'm reading about it, I'm thinking this is really, really coming home to how it was for me. With um, your mum? Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely with the, the way it was for me as I was growing up. Mm. Um, but I was also back in the learning environment. So I quickly remembered how hard it was for me at school. Right. And knowing that she was going through exactly the same as what I was at that moment in time. So it must be nice to have a, a mother who's in a position where she can do a bit of research and find out about how she feels and how you're feeling as well. I mean, how, how do you cope with your ADHD now? Um, I think mainly for me it was... Uh, it's mainly medication, but I think the most important thing to do is learn how to cope without medication because you don't want to be dependent on the medication for mm. your entire life. That's what that's what I'm how do you do hoping that? to do. Um, well, I when I started a, the children's course at the ADHD Foundation when I was about ten, and um, they just give me loads of strategies to cope, to handle it, to help with me um, in school, at home, just in general life. Can I ask you how the medication actually makes a difference? How does it make you feel? What does it do? Um, it, it increases my concentration mainly. That's the benefit that it has for me in school. But it also kind of like brings my energy levels down. Do you like that or dislike that? It depends. If I'm, if I'm in lesson, I like it because I can actually sit there and I can actually enjoy the hour and a half mm -hmm. and of the teacher talking at me. So <laughs> You just said it. <laughs> the teacher talking at me. <laughs> so I can, I, can, I can enjoy that. But then when it comes to lunchtime, I'm sitting there and I'm just like, everyone's mm -hmm. laughing and joking and stuff. And I'm just like... Yeah. You're on like a level. Yeah, and it's, it's, I don't enjoy it, really. Is it nice in a way that you're mum has the same condition so you've got somebody there you can talk to and, and it's it's i think it's amazing to be fair because um i i mean obviously because me growing up in the situation i have grown up obviously i don't know what it's like not to have that mm. safety net but she's taught me everything and as she's learned she's taught me so it, it's basically it's all been second hand nature to me tony you want to come in there and kevin as well kevin yeah I, I just had a point to say about the medication what chloe says there is actually quite pertinent in terms of patients that we see you can actually tailor it according to your need okay. with adhd medication it does not cause dependence it's not something where you're going to get a withdrawal effect if you don't take the medication so if you feel leveled so if out if you feel like, if you, you feel leveled it. out if you feel i mean if you feel it's working and you need to work during the working week five days a week you need the medication you take the medication and quite often patients of mine will not take the medication over weekends when they want that freedom. So, Tony? I think I really just, well, as well, we needed to kind of make the point that, that by and large, ADHD is heritable in about 70% of cases. There's right. usually some kind of family link, whether it's a parent or a grandparent. And obviously, the case of Sharon and Chloe is a really good example mm -hmm. that often you will find ADHD is prevalent in families. And I think that's an important point to get across, really. Yeah. It, Chloe, you, want to, you raised your hand about medication. Do you do, yeah. do, you do what the doctor was talking about? Um, what Dr. Cooper was saying, I, com I completely choose, like, I decide when I need to take my medication, I will take it in right. school and I'll take it for certain lessons, depending on whether I feel I need it and for exams and stuff, but I won't take it at home. I'm just really interested, Chloe, in some of the coping strategies. How, how do you cope when you feel like, say, that you're losing your attention or that you're getting bored? How, how, do, you, how do you cope? 
it's, it's if I don't have my tablet. Mm. Yeah, your own sort of self. Um, I'll way of doing it. I'll get. I'll get. Like, it sounds silly, but I'll get like a, a pen and paper and I'll doodle something. And because I'm using <laughs> me body to like. Rory's use laughing. The, <laughs> you, should see the, you should see the pad of paper in front of me. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> I, I can yeah. see you doodling. Because <laughs> I'm do because I'm using up all my access excess energy. Then. It's allowing my brain to concentrate on what she's actually saying instead of just going in one ear and out the other, what she or he is saying. You know what's so interesting about that is, as well, if you were caught doing that in a classroom 20 years ago, you're all, mm. all being undiagnosed. Do you still get told yeah, off? Yeah, I still get told <laughs> off. My teacher had a go at me, like, last year for drawing the dog on a, on a piece of paper. I was like, but that's how I cope. And she was like, no. Right, we it's haven't got much time left. It's great to hear from you all, but I've got loads of text to read. So I'll read a couple out, and then if whoever wants to answer, jump in, uh, because we've got to hear from Ed Miliband before we leave at four o'clock to balance I'll things do him up. as well, if you like. Oh, can you oh, do it? Right. 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 What's he going to say, Rory? <laughs> I, I, just think it's, I just think it's important that you read the text out first. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Ed, we shall do that. Uh, right, um, Richard says, I'm 54. I believe I have ADHD. I used to get sent out of classes at school. I'm terrible at exams and fear formal education. Education. I made it into a professional position with no formal qualifications. Does this sound like the sort of things that you would expect? And another one to throw in there. I think my son has ADHD. He's 37. Please, can somebody give me some advice? So who would like to take up that? Tony, do you want to jump in on those uh, two? I would just say that if you think you have ADHD, you know, go and speak to your GP. I wouldn't necessarily expect your GP to know a great deal about ADHD, in particular adult ADHD, because it's very much an emerging uh, field. But you can ask your GP for a referral, um, if you're an adult, to a psychiatrist for a comprehensive assessment. And I think that is the only way to find out for certain whether or not you do indeed have adult ADHD. In the case of a child, you would ask your GP for a referral to a paediatrician. OK. And they can do a full assessment there. That's and that's the really important because early diagnosis is really important. Yes. And if you're lucky, you might have access to some support services. I mean, like, you know, Liverpool is very, very well served. With, with Ladders of Life and the Foundation. What and about elsewhere in the country, Andrew? It, not so good, not, really. It's a very, very uneven, uh, you know, patches. And, and very, that's very what some uneven. of the texters are saying. As we've got one guy saying he's been diagnosed under a previous uh, doctor. He's moved somewhere else right. and is now terrified of going to see another yeah. doctor because that doctor might not say it's ADHD yeah. and he won't be able to get any medication and or any help. Unfortunately, because of funding issues throughout the country, the service delivery is quite patchy. So not all areas have specialist adult ADHD services. So it just depends where you are and whether, you know, if there's not a long enough waiting list. Uh, Simon is in Tottenham and he says, if you have ADHD and you don't know it, have you really got a medical problem? Yes. Why, Tony? That's an interesting question. Because you're still going to um, be affected by ADHD. It's going to impact on you in a number of different ways, both in your personal life and your professional life. And don't get me wrong, I mean, as Kuba mentioned before, there are a lot of very successful people who have learned to self-regulate and self-manage their ADHD. Um, I think really it's down to the individual. And again, it's a spectrum disorder, so there are degrees of severity. Some people have it mild, some people have it in quite a severe form. It is going to affect you. I think the knowledge, as Andrew was saying before, that knowledge um, gives, it does give you some power in terms of learning how to understand yourself and your own behaviours and perhaps some of the events and outcomes that have happened in your life. And it also then at least gives you an option to choose certain skills to learn how to manage Totally right, Tony. I mean, I've, many oh, adults have said it's, it's been fantastically liberating to finally find some kind of explanation for these yeah. series of, of problems they've had well, throughout the whole life. And as somebody that doesn't have it, I'm just fascinated to, and I've learned an awful lot, yeah. basically, so uh, I hope that's... It's been great to watch Chloe as well, who's, you've demonstrated your ADHD think... by fiddling with everything <laughs> in the entire studio. <laughs> <laughs> you should see Rory, honestly. We're watching him on the webcam there. Listen, thank you all very much indeed. It's been thank really you. enlightening. Roy Bremner, Cuban Naidu, Tony Lloyd, Andrew Williams, and Chloe and Sharon Williams, no relation. Thank you very much indeed.